And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of Shattered Dawn, and the as well as the as well as one of the heads of Shattered Tabletop Games, the most unserious um, gaming po- gaming podcast that there that there is. The one and only Brian DeSanto. Sorry, not Brian. What am I saying? David DeSanto. <laughs> Jeez, that I was go embarrassing. by many names. <laughs> no, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm David DeSanto, uh, one of the co-creators of Shattered Dawn, uh, Arc Master of the Shattered Dungeons podcast, and like you said, uh, CEO of Shattered Tabletop Games. Yep. I am looking forward to our interview. Yeah. So it's a bit. It's a, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings. Mm, with yes. with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it really stick for you? Oh my! Um, so when I was in middle school, I think I was like sixth grade. Uh, my whole family uh, decided. Well, my dad decided that we were going to sit around and go through a module of second edition uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember sitting down. He, we all made our characters. It was like a whole day event. Um, and uh, my dad ran the game. He dungeon mastered. Uh, my mom and my two siblings, who were old enough to play with us, uh, we were the group. And uh, the way it was explained to me was very much like, hey, you're going to create your character and then you're going to be this character in this adventure. And so, like, whatever you do, like, there's a die you roll for. It's going to be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But you kind of have to really get into it. And that was super easy for, for all of us. We were very imaginative. We, you know, played plenty of video games by that point. We were super stoked about it. Um And so I remember I created an elven paladin and I was so excited. Uh, Every step we went down the dungeon, uh, I actually had some graph paper and I was drawing the map of the dungeon so that, you know, if if we got lost, we could use the map to find our way back. Um, And that kind of that was my first experience with uh, a tabletop role playing game. And from there, I mean, I was hooked. Uh, we, uh, throughout middle school, friends of mine, we would get together periodically and play, uh, in high school, we didn't play as much, but it was very much like a, a family thing. We would get people together to play and, uh, we didn't really play that often through high school. Uh, and so when I moved to college, most, most of the uh, role-playing games we played in, uh, high school were video games or online games, MMOs, uh, and so when we got to college, uh, my friend Ed, who uh, he actually was a character on our uh, arc one of Shattered Dungeons. He played Mr. Business, um, which I'm sure I'll talk about later. Uh, but him and I, uh, he knew I played and I had played for a long time. And uh, for him, it was very much like, a, hey, I want to have the quintessential college experience. Let's play Dungeons and Dragons. And so he asked me and I was like, yeah let's let's do this and so we did the old hey who wants to learn how to play and um i penned an adventure and uh we kind of went from there and at that point we were playing uh we had a group of it had to have been like 10 to 12 people that we would like every week we would play two to three times a week um and we would all take turns being the dungeon master and doing the story and it was very much like a a Marvel Cinematic Universe type of thing. You know, everyone had their character. We all had our subplots and it was a lot. And uh, I did the same kind of thing. I wrote a journal from my character's perspective throughout that entire time. So actually, periodically, we'll go back and and read it just, you know, for the memories. Um, So uh, that's kind of how we got or I got started uh, role playing game wise. I'm very thankful for those experiences. Mm-hmm. Now, 
when now um when it came to the development of um sh- of Shattered Dawn, mm-hmm. the f- how how did the initial idea come about? Was it was it a case where you guys were doing um doing house rules for an existing game that just got out of hand and became its own thing, or <laughs> was it Not... in response to a um to game design ideas that kind of bugged you? It was a very weird um, beginning to that. Um, honestly, going back to the college RPG experiences. Uh, me and a bunch of friends at the time had decided, you know, let's make our own, you know, let's reskin uh, at the time third edition Dungeons and Dragons and let's put it in a post apocalyptic thing and incorporate some things from some other RPGs. And so I actually have that document floating around somewhere. Uh, it's on some hard drive. But uh, so that was the first time we actually did anything in regards to. Um, trying to make our own tabletop experience so uh we did that and then years passed we forgot about it uh a lot of those people and i um didn't necessarily see each other that often anymore and so probably oh my gosh uh it would have had to been six seven years ago now um I remember coming across it as we were moving and then just, you know, re-enlightenment. I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about this. What? These are some great concepts. And so I actually took some of the ideas from that and made a whole nother uh, space, uh, you know, futuristic version instead of this post-apocalyptic idea. And uh, I did the whole nine yards. Uh, I wrote it, edited it. Uh, did some very basic artwork all by myself. And that was actually the first time I had like sat down to pen any type of game uh, on my own. And we play tested it and it played fine, but it wasn't like, it was cool, you know, it was fun, but it wasn't like, man, this is awesome. And so that idea kind of crumbled. Um, and, at that point in my life, I was just looking to be playing once a week. It's very much something for me that I need in my life. The, uh, you know, once a week hanging out with some friends, getting some role playing game on, you know, uh, for me, that helps center and ground me and keep me sane. And we had been playing this Marvel, Marvel, uh, GURPS basically, um, Mm -hmm. MURPS, if you will. And that was a a really fun time. It was kind of the same scenario like in college for me. Uh, A couple of my friends were like, hey, you know, we're thinking about doing this. We knew we know you're into it. Would you be interested in, you know, all getting together as a group and doing this? And of course, same as before. Absolutely. I love this. And so we played uh, once a week at my friend's house. We would get together every month, every Monday night uh, and play for two or three hours. Um. And that's kind of the the branching off point of how everything started with Shattered Dawn. Um, I remember sitting there having basically every archetype of RPG player, quote unquote, that you could have at a table. We had a guy who was really, you know, very socially charismatic. We had a guy who was very uh, introverted and... Um, didn't really want to be out and about with a whole bunch of people. We had a guy who had never played before and wasn't really that into it. We had a guy who was, who had never played before and was really into it. Um, And we had a couple others who were just really in it for the the social part of it and Mm -hmm. others who were really into it for the game part of it. And so um, I remember sitting around uh, playing one evening and thinking to myself, wow, what a, interesting representation of rpg players um most of the people that i would ask to play are so put off by playing role-playing games because usually you know it's doing math and reading and like studying and there really is a lot of work that goes into it oftentimes and for people who love it absolutely it makes it awesome but for people who really don't want to you know have to get a degree to play a game um you know it's it's off-putting 
And so I'd asked a couple other people if they wanted to join, and they basically gave me that same response, like, eh, you know, I like the idea of it, but actually doing it, no thanks. And so um, me and Andrew, our content mm -hmm. director, um, we basically got together, and I had come up with this rule set. And it was very much inspired by video games, the mentality of video games. So the way I had established character creation was to only take 10 to 15 minutes unless you were, you know, making the most epic level character ever. Um, but for anyone who was probably joining a pretty fresh game, it was really just three quick steps. Um, it took longer to read your options than it did to actually make the character, you know. Um, and so I put the rule set together and I did some basic play testing. Uh, and then from there, I was like, hey, guys, here's what I'm thinking and kind of laid out the idea of Shattered Dawn. And the way our group, that same group of people I was talking about earlier, the way all of our different um, backgrounds and mindsets kind of played into things, we were kind of prepared to be a a board game company we had a dude who was really good with graphic design uh an actual author um i uh feel like i'm pretty decent with game balancing uh we had a guy who used to be in sales uh and then we had a couple other people who not only did um internet you know financial stuff but also um was good with just like you know cold calling people effectively just mm -hmm. putting himself out there and making things happen and so uh, the content uh, director, Andrew, and myself uh, kind of got to work penning the actual game. Uh, and from there, it became our company. And then from uh, there, we put out first edition. Mm -hmm. um, we put that on Kickstarter. Uh, I actually pulled it up just to have it as a reference. Uh, we raised $10,120 with 73 backers. Um, and uh, did our first print run of Shattered Dawn. Uh, and so that's kind of how that started. Mm -hmm. the, the heart behind it was basically, hey, I want to do a game where people can just jump in and go rather than you know having to schedule out session one or, or session zero, rather, and then another day for session one and the, all this back and forth. I really wanted people to, people to be able to um, sit down with their friends and like on a whim say hey you guys want to do this and everyone be able to just jump into it and go mm -hmm. um and when we do conventions uh obviously we do play tests when we're at conventions but um that's one of the things that always kind of takes people aback they sit down and they're like all right where's the pre-made characters and i'm like no <laughs> there are none we're gonna make your character and then we're gonna play for an hour and it's gonna be awesome and uh, being able to use the characters that were freshly made by them that they have their own buy-in to mm -hmm. uh, and run them through an adventure, uh, however small that may be, um, it really does kind of take people aback, which is, you know, awesome on my end. That's the goal. I want people to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the heart in the beginning of Shattered Dawn yep. and uh, Shattered Tabletop Games. Um now you had mentioned that you had t that um a lot of it started from you guys hacking um third D and D third edition. Actually, uh, the first attempt at doing a um any any uh, reskin or anything like that was from third edition. Shattered mm -hmm. Dawn, from a rule set standpoint, we actually didn't hack anything. Uh, I took inspiration from a lot of video game concepts, mm -hmm. actually. And so to um, to kind of explain how the game works a little bit, if, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, basically, it's a D100 system, mm -hmm. which is a fancy way of saying for every roll, you roll one D100, which basically is a percentile dice and a mm -hmm. single digit 10 sided dice. Mm -hmm. And so that gives you anywhere from z zero, 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 which I reference as 100. Uh, so it's one to 100. And then you add whatever bonuses you have from your character. Uh, so that's a key aspect of it. You're only rolling one dice for everything. So mm -hmm. it's really simple to explain to someone, hey, if you're going to do something, roll this dice. The other aspect is it is classless. So for a lot of role-playing games, they have 
uh, classes or character archetypes or different builds for a character that you kind of track down and, you know, at this level you get this, at that level you get that. Um, with Shattered Dawn, you basically craft your character as you go. Um, every kind of detail of it. So if you want to be a dude who's, you know, running around naked, singing songs at people and punching people in the face during combat or like even just through a mm -hmm. town, you can straight up do that and there's not really like a a negative penalty for doing that yeah. uh, conversely if you want to wear full you know tank it up and wear the heaviest armor imaginable and basically you know fight with a towel like you can do that if you really want to um uh so there it is uh kind of wacky some of the characters that people come up with mm -hmm. um but because it's classless, everyone gets to really develop exactly what they want to play rather than saying, you know, I'm going to be this archetype. Yeah. Um, and so I, I have gotten in during play tests, some very weird character builds. Uh, and then the, the third thing that kind of sets us apart from a lot of other people, we have a, it, basically Shattered Dawn is set up to be a narrative story. And so where a lot of times when you're playing a role-playing game, something happens and you kind of have to go reference a rule. Uh, we kind of made the game to not be so rule heavy. There's rules for a lot of stuff, sure, but they're all fairly simple to understand and they all kind of feel the same, if that makes sense. Um, and even in our core rule books, uh, I think the first like couple of pages, the very first thing I, I think I might have it pulled up actually. Uh I'm looking in our second edition book, which mm -hmm. we, we haven't uh, released yet, um, but it says, uh, it is direly important to note that the Arc Master, which we call our Dungeon Master, has uh, final say on anything in the game. Uh, and so that means if there's question about rules in the moment, the Arc Master, whatever he, says, says, he or she says goes. Uh, they supersede anything for the interest of storytelling. And so that's kind of the focus of our game is not so much sitting down and trying to um, play a rule set, but play a story. And uh, a lot of the rules that we have written, as well as the lore and world history, uh, gear itself towards storytelling rather than, like I said, just playing a rule set. Yeah, I can I can definitely uh, get that. Now, one thing I'm curious about is the use of a, the use of D100 because unless I'm because a lot of times when I see D100 um, systems, it's always a percentile based roll over roll on under. I, I won't say mm -hmm. always. It is that case a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, the the. So the uh, big, the big um, culprits, of course, being st stuff like Rune Quest or uh, Ro or Warhammer. Mm -hmm. But you're using a roll over approach. Yep. So uh, basically, each character, based on again those traits I was referencing earlier, mm -hmm. uh, gains a bonus to certain tasks. And just like you were st stating a moment ago, you roll the dice and you add that bonus to it. Um, a lot of the attacks and combat and things like that are that way uh, for a couple of different reasons. The first of which being uh, we felt a D100 uh, kind of better represented the wide gamut of, of what could potentially happen. Um, but then also there are certain effects uh, that use the percentile role. And so where a lot of people who play just naturally want to add their bonus to it, you do have certain things that are percentage based. So a great example is something in the game called mischance. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of rule sets that say roll as mischance, which simply means um, roll it like you would roll a mischance. Now in Shattered Dawn, mischance is a roll under percentage. So if you have 20% mischance, if you roll a D100 and you get from one to 20, that means whatever attack that was rolled against you, even though it says it hit, actually misses or is otherwise blocked. Um, with the additive rolls, uh, such as attack rolls, 
um, what we call stamina checks and potency checks, those are um, almost used in a wagering fashion. Uh, attack rolls, not so much. That kind of depends on your character's build and, and advancements. But uh, basically, we use it kind of almost uh, <laughs> like betting, <laughs> if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, stamina checks and potency checks take the place of like saves, for example. So if someone's going to poison you or you need to jump across a chasm or anything that would inquire, uh, require a physical um, resistance or uh, role, uh, we do something called a stamina check. And basically each character has a health pool, a potency pool, and a stamina pool. And the stamina pool is obviously physical aptitude. Mm -hmm. And so you declare how much you're going to add to your roll, and then you roll it, and that's what you get. You get yeah. the roll plus whatever you wagered. And then you weigh that against someone else's attack roll or an opposed stamina check or whatever and determine who wins the the challenge, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, po potency checks are the exact same way, except they use the potency pool, which is kind of like your magical aptitude spell casting. Um, but it also requires that you cast the spell associated with what you're trying to do. For instance, if a dragon breathes fire at you, and you know a spell like Fire Skin that gives you 100% resistance to fire, you would have to not only cast Fire Skin, but then roll a potency check against the dragon's attack roll uh, to see if you can cast it quick enough to be protected from his fire breath. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that concept uh, basically is ha half of the combat uh, rules right there, Those that simple explanation. Um, and then all the attack rolls are basically add your attack bonus, and if you hit, you deal the damage that is kind of a... a, a um, you're not rolling for damage. Uh, damage is a constant rating. Uh, so if you're using, you know, a sword that has, you know, 10 damage and you gain a plus two to damage, then your damage every time you hit with that sword is 12 damage. Mm -hmm. um, there are critical hits. There are power attacks. You can deal half damage if you want, if you're trying to keep someone alive. Uh, so there are different ways you can modify that, but for the most part, the, the damage is constant. So, yeah. And when it, now, when it comes, given what you mentioned about the whole potency and wagering, um, mm -hmm. would it be, would it be fair to say that your game emphasizes contested roles rather than roles against, um, static difficulties? Yes and no. Anything that is combat oriented <clears throat> is basically a contested role for the most part, not everything. Um, armor is a constant rating, but uh, again, stamina checks, potency checks, those are used uh, to basically allow you to kind of decide how your character reacts to something. Um, and so that can be a very powerful tool for someone who's, dropped a bunch of a bunch of their pool points uh every level you gain those that you can drop in your health potency or stamina so someone who's dumped a lot of those into their stamina for example can dodge more things or uh deal with area effect spells better than someone who who hasn't um as far as the other things like sneaking pickpocketing all that those are uh, a combination. Some of them are contested roles. Uh, for instance, sneak is a contest contested role. Uh, but a lot of the other ones, like lock picking, uh, pickpocketing, performance, things like that, those are against a predetermined uh, rating. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, if a character, someone new to the game, is wanting to try something that their character would most likely want to try to do, usually it's a contested role. And we did that specifically more so with second edition than first edition to kind of emphasize the um, the uh, the one on one uh, nature of doing some of those things. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're sneaking around playing Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or something, it can be like, oh, I rolled a, you know, five and ah, well, I definitely didn't get that. 
But with Shattered Dawn, you know, even though you rolled crappy, it, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that you lost. Sometimes, you know, someone may be distracted by, and that's how I would explain a terrible die roll. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, th that's kind of the goal is to make it feel more interactive rather than you're playing against a rule set. So. Yeah. In, the, in, that in that regard, would you say that you're an advocate for fail forward? Fail, uh, define fail forward for me. I think um, I know what you're talking about. I just want to make sure before I answer. <laughs> fail forward is a school of thought I've seen. I've seen among some. I mean, among some DMs and game designers over the last few years. the i The idea being is that what is that a fail a failed roll shouldn't be shouldn't be a um. De a dead stop for narrative for narrative momentum um the idea be the the idea being that if someone if someone fails a role it doesn't mean that they that they just couldn't do what they were doing it it means that they tried but something el like something else got in the way is um the common description mm -hmm. um it depends on the situation uh, and that goes back to just kind of leaning in on the arc master's discretion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for instance, using our podcast as an example, there are plenty of times where a cast member wants their character to pick a lock. And oftentimes, you know, a lock pick is a great example of something you can just kind of continuously try unless something, you know, chaotic happens. Um, so in instances like that, usually I'll allow them to roll a couple of times. Uh, the heart behind it, though, is not, you know, you have an unlimited amount of rolls to do this, but it's more of a, hey, we're hanging out here, resting for an hour, trying to get into this lock. Over the course of an hour, <clears throat> each roll is probably going to take about five to ten minutes while you're working on it. So realistically you have a little bit more time to work with than just like one roll and you're done. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there are some times where from a story standpoint or a timing standpoint that I do need to just kind of cut it off at the, at the, uh, with one roll. Um, and for instances like that, uh, <clears throat> we try and leave as much of that type of stuff to the arc master rather than putting in a nitty gritty rule detail. Um, because it honestly depends if we have a situation like that and someone's, you know, a player rules lawyer, if you will, starts getting up at you about, Hey, you know, I can do this an unlimited amount of times. The rules don't say anything. The arc master can always point back to arc master discretion. What I say goes, uh, and use that to advance the story. So mm -hmm. we're not sitting around rolling 400 dice until he gets it, you know? Yeah. Now, taking taking that into, taking that into account, into account, one of the things I did want to ask is on mm -hmm. advancements and on the tree system that you're utilizing. Um, sure. Yeah. How? What was the reasoning for doing for doing this um, tree based approach? Well, uh, to put it simply. Um, that was one of the inspiration we had from a couple different video games. Um, growing up in high school, I played a lot of Star Wars Galaxies, for those of you who may have played that. That was mm -hmm. uh, a favorite game of mine. One of the things I really loved about it was its classless system. And what I found with it is that every build that you could do as a character was incredibly unique based on what you wanted to do. So there were... Uh, you know, different archetypes of builds, you know, defense stacker, uh, you know, DPS, all sorts of things, but you could really f fine tune it based on your choices of skills is what they call them. And so with the, um, the uh, tree based advancement approach, that's kind of like a spiritual successor to that, uh, if you will. Uh, my goal is uh, with the different trees is to provide basically differing ways of playing the same type of of uh character trait mm -hmm. so um i'll use one-handed as an example if you look at the 
uh, light melee tree is what it's called in the book, but basically it's any one-handed weapon. Uh, there are really four different, maybe five, six, if I'm really getting technical, uh, ways you can play that tree in and of itself. You can use it to dual wield, which, you know, is straightforward. You have two weapons in your hand. You can focus on um, swords and daggers, uh, axes and um, things like that, various mm -hmm. sized axes. Uh, and then you can focus on blunt weapons, maces, hammers, clubs, all that stuff. And uh, so that's, what is that, four? And then you can do basically only one-handed weapon, like not dual wield, just a single weapon, no shield. Or you could do the sword and shield or the one-handed weapon and shield. And then the... Um, the last one is basically a daggers only approach um, or a single dagger approach. Uh, so basically the difference in each of them, dual wield gives you the most amount of attacks, uh, which again, can be super helpful if you're looking to just output DPS uh, damage per second. Mm -hmm. If you take the dagger approach, dual wield daggers, that actually has the most potential damage output when paired with our um, the tree that basically gives you sneak attacks. Um, with the axes, it gives you more outright damage, uh, but it doesn't... Um, uh, but you, you do less on critical hits. Mm -hmm. With blunt weapons... Um, it will actually, you have the potential to not only deal damage to a character's stamina pool, um, but it also, those, uh, yeah, no, they, they deal, deal damage against the stamina pool. And then the swords have the most critical chance, uh, swords and daggers. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a trade-off. And then when you're doing a single one-handed weapon, you actually have the potential to get three attacks um, at, at the higher levels. And so if you're thinking about doing like a samurai build type of uh, vibe, um, that's how you could do that. And then, of course, you got your classic sword and shield. Uh, and late game, that gives you two attacks with the sword. Mm -hmm. And if you go down the tree for shield, you can get a shield bash attack with that. Um, and so that's kind of a good example of why we did the tree aspect. Um, each tree may symbolize one type of trait, but just because there's a tree there doesn't mean that you're locked into a particular way of playing that tree. Um, the, uh, the trees for me are just way easier than going through and explaining, hey, here's all 310 advancements, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, each tree has somewhere in the ballpark from any, anywhere from like 12 to 25 individual traits underneath that tree all lumped in to describe that one yeah. tree um and so if you just had a list of, you know of hey here's all the things you could potentially do and you know here's the limitations and here's what you uh require to get this trait it can be a lot uh and so i found that uh actually in, uh, one of the major changes between mm -hmm. first and second edition is how that section of the rule book is laid out um because there are people that get overwhelmed by it. And then there are other people who really want that detail to be able to go in and really reference things. And so the way we laid it out, it's a little easier on the eyes, mm -hmm. not as intimidating. Yeah. Um, but then again, with our starter kit, which uh, we actually just got our prototype in for a second edition starter kit today, um, that has an abridged rule book in it. So for people who are wanting to test this out, um, try out Shattered Dawn and maybe see if it uh, works for them and what they want to do. The abridged rulebook only has uh, basically two tiers of advancement for every uh, tree. So you're not getting all 310 advancements or 321 or whatever it is. Um, there you're just outright getting you know, the necessary low level advancements to choose from. So there you're maybe looking at you know, maybe I think it's like 40 total uh, in the book uh, for the uh, starter kit. Um, but uh, each level, you can only choose two. So even though there might be 40, your character is only going to be able to spend two points every level 
Um, and so le early game, <clears throat> it forces characters to become wider rather than really dialing into a certain path. Um, whereas late game, you know, at the higher levels, uh, you really do have the opportunity to maybe max out two trees and then mm -hmm. um, you'll have to fill in, you know, round your character out a little bit more. <laughs> so it kind of forces some role play aspect a little bit, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Now, I, w I will I will admit that I did I did like how it's how it lists off um the the potential um advancements by what level they're in because I've seen because doing that kind of thing can can definitely make it easier for people to have some clue about what they're going to do and not fall into the pre-planning trap mm, which yeah. um as somebody who's play, who's played third edition D&D &D, you're probably well acquainted with that problem yep <laughs> um Ooh, I, I need exactly I, this to do exactly that. <laughs> um, well, the feed the feed example I always use from third edition that's my whipping boy for this problem is whirlwind mm. strike. Oh yeah. Um, which I will give me a moment. I'll t and of course it's and of course it's just as guilty in path in path in Pathfinder, but. Mm -hmm. If I, if I, the Pathfinder version, you needed all of the following. You needed a dexterity and intelligence of 13. You needed combat expertise, dodge, mobility, spring attack, and a BAB of plus four. <laughs> yep, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I would play uh, a character where I was going for whirlwind attack and just trying to knock off all of those check boxes it was so time consuming and really required a lot of thought and planning with uh the way the advancements pan out with shattered dawn um you they're broken down by level and so uh you have to have the level requirement you also have to have the points available to spend mm -hmm. so the lower level advancements require one point Mid-level requires two points. High-level requires three points for each advancement. Um, and then the only other really thing you need is, you know, certain things build on other things. So, uh, for example, you can't be a grandmaster of one-handed uh, light melee combat uh, if you've never taken advancements in light melee tree, you know. Uh, so some of that is kind of logical. It's, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a single thing that's kind of, kind of out of nowhere. Um, but you know, you also can't go in and choose, uh, flame disciple three when you don't have flame disciple two or one, you know? Um, so a lot of that is more logical. It's not necessarily like, oh, you have to be this type of character to do this. It's just, you know as you level up and gain advancements, naturally you're going to become better at something. And so that's kind of how we, we work that in from a role-playing standpoint into a rule set. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, um, obviously, obviously this is the, this we're dealing with a, a, um, we're dealing with a fantasy game, but fan mm -hmm. fantasy is a very wide net. Very and true. Argu arguably, a big problem that D and D has had is the fact that it's never wanted to. It's never wanted to um, figure out if it wants to shit or get off the pot as far as what kind of fantasy it is. <laughs> yeah. But where? But where in the spectrum would you say Shattered Dawn's um, brand of fantasy is? Would you say that you're? Would you say that it's more in the realm of high? Would you say it's more in the realm of sword and sorcery? It is dark fantasy, absolutely. Um, to so a big part of our game is our campaign setting mm -hmm. if you will uh the game doesn't necessarily s allow for different uh campaign settings a lot of it is unique to the world that we've crafted um you can obviously take it and do do the rule set with a different campaign and all that mm -hmm. but there are certain things that are just outright unique to what we've written uh so part of the 
uh, major thing about Shattered Dawn is kind of our uh, world narrative, if you will. Uh, there are probably about 60 to 70 pages of just lore uh, in our book. Um, and that delves in really deep. We're talking thousands of years of history. You know, there's a war over here between the centaurs and what, what we call the ethel, um, stuff like that. Uh, which if you're interested in hearing more about our world history specifically, mm -hmm. I think it's episode one of the Shattered Dungeons podcast uh, literally is like 40 minutes of just lore. Uh, it might be 20 minutes now that I'm thinking about it. But if you want to know more, definitely give that a listen. Uh, but with the um, uh, kind of the can our, our world setting, uh, basically a tyrant has risen to power. Uh, he is being corrupted from an unseen magical force, unbeknownst to everyone. And a prophet by the name of Stannis Longfinger has realized what's going on, and he has been put to death for uh, communicating his prophecy. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, because of the corruption that's happened with the... Uh, patriarch is uh, what his title is, Patriarch of the Aluin Patriarchy. Um, there is a, something called the Reaping that happens every seven years. And basically what the concept is, is every country has to pay a thousand gold for the, every free citizen that they have within their borders, or they have to basically tribute them to the patriarchy to be cast into this otherworldly uh, dimension as a sacrifice uh, to the patriarch's power and uh, authority. And so uh, the first adventure in our starter kit um, is basically a group of heroes who have escaped the reaping uh, and then have to begin their lives anew. Uh, everything they've known beforehand, they were offered up as tribute and branded as a tribute. So they can't really go around, you know, flaunting all all their body because they got a brand on it that says hey i'm a a criminal of the world order um and so that's kind of a great example of how the world is set um it is a classic uh there are no stereotypically good people uh organizations or individuals in the world everyone has their own kind of struggles i'll say Mm -hmm. their own uh their own dark past uh and much like we see in real life sometimes you have to make the those um uh sometimes you have to deal with those struggles of uh, people's uh greed and pride and um just downright nastiness and other times you do have those those examples of you know lights in a dark place uh, and oftentimes I find with playtests that uh, because the world around them that we've built is so incredibly dark, they're more inclined, our players for the most part, not always, but for the most part, are more inclined to be either heroes or anti-heroes, uh, you know, vigilantes even. Um, the, uh, the whole world, as far as um, historical uh, or his, his history of Shattered Dawn, uh, our world history um, uh, basically begins with uh, a species called the Ethel and them coming to power and deciding that they are the perfect creation upon the planet and then subjugating everything else that isn't like them. And uh, that's kind of, you know, thousands of years of history in uh, like a couple of sentences, basically. Uh, but that that's where things kind of pack up. There were... Um, there were uh, rebellions and uh, people rising up against that and they fell from grace mm -hmm. and power and then in the in the recent history, the recent past if you will uh, they came back for a final hurrah and saved the world and now everyone everyone was super happy about that and so they offered the power back to the, the Aluin patriarchy only for it to be corrupted once more not only by their own pride, but also this unseen outside force. Mm -hmm. And with 
something that I did something that I did find interesting it is while the, while there's well plenty of the races that you've gotten that you've got in the game and there's no shortage of them um, have their own benefits. Um, mm -hmm. The it's usually it's usually a sink it's typically a singular benefit and there's not really a whole lot in the way of the typical stat modifi modifiers that you'd see in a lot of fantasy games when it comes to races. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that goes back to uh, a streamlined rule set. Uh, so just to walk you through a little bit of how character creation works, basically you're making uh, just a couple of choices. You're choosing your species. Uh, you're choosing your two... You're spending your two advancement points that you get at level one. Um and then you're basically writing down all the information uh, and writing a backstory or giving your character some starting equipment. And so uh, when you're looking at how your character is created and or develops, um, your uh, kind of species benefit is beneficial, but it's not necessarily something that is a game-changing uh, attribute for your character long term a great example would be for um dargoth and to put it simply uh for those of you who don't know what a dargoth is which i'm sure are many of our uh the listeners right now mm -hmm. um dargoth are basically uh milky white dull gray skinned uh eight ten to twelve foot tall uh horned giants um, they get a bonus to their uh, damage rating. Uh, they take a negative to their armor rating, uh, which is the only thing in the game, I believe, that is a, a penalty, if you will. Uh, and then they gain a bonus to their stamina pool. And so at level one, I'm going to use second edition for an for example, at level one, every character starts with 20 points in their health pool, their potency pool, and their stamina pool. The Dargoth get a bonus 20 stamina points. Mm -hmm. So now their stats are 20 health, 20 potency, 40 stamina. But their armor rating goes down by 10, which the base armor rating, if you're wearing nothing, is 20. And so they're already at you know 10 on a D100 will hit them. So 90% of the time, they're going to take damage. Uh, and then they deal an additional um, uh, 10 points of damage in melee combat. And so if they're fighting with a, a melee weapon or maybe their fists, they're dealing a significant amount of damage. Mm -hmm. Now at level one, you know, let's say they had a heavy melee weapon that deals more than 10 damage. Now they're killing someone in one shot. And, you know, at level one, that's detrimental. But... If you think of someone going up in a fight, you know, the old David and Goliath uh, story, you know, unless, you know, the sling is magical, <laughs> you know, the, the giant's probably going to win that fight. Um, you know, if someone doesn't have, uh, you know, obviously their outlying circumstances and divine intervention at stake in that story. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if, you know, I'm going to walk up and fight someone two to three times my size who has bulging muscles. And I'm sitting here with, you know, my, my stick, I'm probably going to lose. But the, uh, even once you get to second level, that bonus uh, for being a Dargoth instantly does not become as painful. Uh, every level you gain 20 more points to spend in your pools and so our Dargoth now that can hit for 20 damage uh, won't one-shot me if I put mine in health. Um, and so, uh, you know, and it just keeps going up by that. By the time you get to um, about, I would say, level 10, which is, uh, max level is 50, so a fifth of the way there, uh, you have the potential of having well more than 100 points in your health pool. And so 10 additional damage per turn really isn't that, that crazy. I mean, it's helpful, yeah, but having 10 less armor ratings suddenly becomes way more of a problem than your 10 additional damage. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just one species, though, as an example. The Basilican, for example, can uh, breathe underwater, and that's super helpful in niche situations, obviously. 
they're good at swimming. Uh, several of the other species gain bonuses to different pools by 20 points. Norethel, for, for example, gain 20 potency, so they're better at spell casting. Uh, and then you have other species that have more practical uh, benefits. Norseracin, for example, are kind of like, you know, think Vikings. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have 50% cold resistance. So if someone's shooting them with ice, you know, they have a 50-50 shot of not really taking any damage from it. But that also depends on maybe the who you're fighting, the adventure you're in, what part of the world you're in, things like that. And so the, the benefits are certainly beneficial, but they by no means have a very heavy uh, effect on a character overall. It's definitely kind of like, you know, um, just a, an added little like, oh, cool, rather than a, oh, my gosh, my character needs to be centered around this trait. Uh, and again, that's for developing unique characters. Uh, we didn't want to have a species trait uh, trump someone's advancements or the amount of practice they have doing something, you know? Yeah. Um, when it Now, when it comes to magic, mm -hmm. um, now, ob obviously, as somebody who's dealt with their fair share of fantasy games, you're probably familiar with how some of them give a little bit too much attention to magic. And yes. But given that you're dealing with a dark, a lot of times with dark fantasy, um, magic is not magic is not so e is not so easily abused, ideally. Whether it be mm -hmm. whether it be a case of magic being poorly understood, being fairly dangerous, or somewhere in the middle, um, what does Shattered Dawn do, do to maintain the dark fantasy vibe within its magic systems? So uh, a big part of uh, the world history centers around the Ethel's pursuit of immortality through magic. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of monsters and even some of the species you play as, uh, their history revolves around this weird magical experimentation. Uh, so you get um, instances where like, you, there are certain beasts that were around for many, many years along with the Ethel that they didn't really know about, uh, dragons being an example. And then you have other ones that uh, were created just accidentally. And, uh, you know, those are things from, like, walking trees, ghosts, things like that, where mm -hmm. people were just screwing around with magic and got a little too ahead of themselves. Um, from a uh, game-balancing, lore-balancing standpoint, Magic is definitely an integral part of the world. Uh, everyone has the capacity to cast spells and learn spells, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all powerful and everyone is, you know, going crazy. Um, I would think about it uh, if I were to make a parallel. Uh, I, I would kind of look at it from a Lord of the Rings standpoint. You know, magic is there, and sometimes it seems very mundane. Mm -hmm. uh, but even though it's there and maybe mundane, it has the potential to be very powerful uh, on, in the right hands or circumstances. Um, so going back to kind of the, the rules, um, magic early on uh, is super helpful because you don't necessarily need anything to do it. Uh, you have to know the spells and you have to have enough potency to cast those spells. Um, but it's not like you need something to focus on, like, you, uh, you know, like some tangible thing to be spent. What you're doing is basically spending your potency, which is a energy that, uh, you know, is in and around everything. And so you kind of draw on that mystical thing and cast this magical spell based on your training. And, Early on, honestly, magic isn't super powerful. It's maybe got a slight leg up because you can do some area effect stuff mm -hmm. with certain spells. But for the most part, it's very utilitarian. Um, it's, you know, niche circumstances. And it's like, you know, uh, oak skin, for example, gives your character a better armor rating. But it doesn't stack with physical armor. 
it literally just, you know, if you're not wearing armor, at least you got something on. Um, but then you get to the higher level spells that require more potency, that require um, uh, more resources to be spent to learn them, uh, that require your character to actually be specced with potency in mind, um, that you get to do some really cool things like uh, gravity reversal is a great one. Uh, we have a spell called Permanence, which makes the next spell cast a permanent effect or um, uh, um, effect or affect, if you will, on what you're doing. So, like, if you if a character wanted to continuously raise zombies and create an army of undead, there's an avenue to do that. Uh, conversely. If you want to spend time to develop your own unique spell, uh, there's a, a system in the book uh, to do that as well. Um, a lot of the uh, uh, notable Erethaeans, I'll say, which are basically high-level NPCs that are figures in the world at large, um, if you look at their character sheet in the book, you'll see a lot of unique spells that aren't listed in the spell sections because they've developed them on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to that magic being an integral part, there there's a uh, an NPC called the Father of Monsters, and his whole kind of thing is that he continuously experiments on things with magic and creates these grotesque abominations of of disfigured and uh, of creations that used to be, you know, whoever. And so one of his spells is a unique signature spell called fathering of monsters. And basically it turns them into whatever the arc master wants, if it hits and uh, it's a permanent spell on top of that. So it's not like, you know, you get hit and, Oh, your shape changed for, you know, a couple turns. It's like, Oh, you're a spoon now. Sorry. Uh, hopefully, you know, people survive this fight and can turn you back. But uh, if not, prepare to be used for cereal. Um, so uh, magic is definitely a big part of our game. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily overshadow uh, other aspects of the game. I feel like it's pretty well balanced. Um, but it does afford characters opportunities to have some uh, special abilities that that they may work towards just to get that one spell or um, use in a, in a niche fashion, just so that their character is a little bit more round. Mm -hmm. Now take now taking that, taking all that, taking all that into account, did you, um, how, um, given the fact that you're using a um, classless system, would you say that mm -hmm. your game is fairly amenable for people who want to run Gish? Uh, what is Gish? Gish well, is a nickname that was originally derived from, um, like the Githyanki ra race when that when that got at when that got added. It's basically a shorthand for characters who are decent at both. Um, co at both mundane combat and slinging spells. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so basically, because of the way character creation and advancement happens, you can really gear your character, like I said earlier, to be whatever you want it to be. And honestly, there are, we've play tested second edition and first edition even. Uh, pretty hard to try and find things that might be way, you know, overpowered or broken. And uh, we've yet to find anything that's seriously broken in any sense of the word. Um, but uh, so you can basically s develop your character. Um, and honestly, it's one of my favorite builds to play uh, to where you are using your spells and fighting in phys physical combat. Mm -hmm. as your whole turn the way um the way spell casting and combat work is kind of based on um hands available if you will so everyone can do wield because we all have two hands um some creatures have four or six or eight and they get more attacks but um if uh if you want to play as uh someone who's using you know a sword with one hand and attacking twice and using spells in your other hand and attacking twice. That's doable. 
um, early on, you only get one attack each hand, but as you develop your skills and training, you get more. Mm -hmm. um, a great example, uh, again, this build I'm about to share, one of my favorite builds is basically a, uh, a summoning soldier. Um, and so what I do with that, I'll either take hand-to-hand -hand or heavy armor, and those will give me some semblance of defense. Um, and so I can either wear nothing or I can wear armor. Uh, and then what I do is I track down the summoning tree uh, and the heavy melee tree. And basically what I what I do there is I summon a great sword and then proceed to use all my heavy melee with it with that great sword. Um, what I what I've done by that is I've created a great sword that's actually better than most great swords I can find early on in the game and I deal more damage because of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Another build that is really fun to play um, is, uh, you know, Sword Caster. And so you can take just a regular old sword, a dagger, an axe, hammer, just one-handed. And then in your other hand, basically have your damage or healing spells uh, being able to cast. And uh, a lot of the times, people generally take some kind of healing spell just to have that in, in the book you know in the mind locked away somewhere for those situations where you just need a heal um but then you pair that with things like elementalism um or even um deception uh can be fun deception mm -hmm. magic is things like mind control and things like that invisibility uh and so you're walking around with your sword doing your thing and then you're shooting fireballs with the, the with the uh, other hand you know and so that can create a very um, uh, a very useful character in any combat situation. But then it can also, um, again, taking deception magic, magic, be useful to suddenly gain allies or cause a stir um, in a situation that might call for it. One mm -hmm. of my favorite playtests I ever did had a dude who did that build, uh, one-handed uh, light melee and deception. And so what he would do is basically cast, uh, there's a spell called Rage, and it does exactly what you think. You cast Rage on a creature, and if your attack is better than their, uh, their uh, armor, they go into a frenzy and start attacking the closest thing to them. And so he would do that. He would start a fight somewhere else and then come behind them and start picking them off while they're focused on the other guys. Uh and then you have people uh, who, <laughs> I don't know where this came from, but basically people like to do finger guns. <laughs> and so you can do a one-handed crossbow, uh, you know, a single shot one-handed crossbow in one hand. And then finger guns doing like a fire bolt or a flaming arrow or an ice arrow or something with your other hand. And so you're getting a couple different options there uh, using the same general type of tree yeah i i do remember in one i do remember in one case some um in, in a different game a friend a friend of mine one wanted to wanted to use but wanted to use both um both bi both binding magic and summoning to create what he called the nicholas cage cage <laughs> oh no you know Please tell me more. <laughs> tra basically, you using using binding to trap to trap a target in place, and then using summoning to summon a swarm of bees around them. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> um, and of course, and of course, oh. I'm, of course, I'm I'm no stranger. Given how the most infamous story that I've ever had is the whole rule with the up button. Oh, <laughs> um, it was basically a rune trap that, that I made that when somebody steps on it, they're um, they're treated as if they casted fly on themselves straight up for four seconds at 40 miles an hour. Oh, um, no. And near the end of the encounter. Um, and I've told this story a few a few times, but a we're in, we're fighting a dragon at the bottom of a dungeon. He steps on the trap and the spell activates. And my G and my GM says, but he's 
But there's but he's under but he's underground. There's a and there's a ceiling barely over him. It's still it's still four seconds. He still has to yeah. go up four seconds. It doesn't matter what's in front of him. Oh no! So yeah, the dragon <laughs> literally got crushed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, like I, I am, I am very much in favor of people coming up with what the technical term is referred to as dumb shit. <laughs> it makes it memorable for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> oh. But that's when... one of the things that uh, we've been enjoying with the uh, the podcast mm -hmm. is that the way we do our show, mm -hmm. um, it is very interactive. Uh, we stream live on Twitch. People generate um, a, a channel points on Twitch, and we have systems in place where you can catch those in to affect the show. Uh, so last week, uh, I think it was Apple, Arc 2, Episode 18. Uh, the episode starts with a fight. A caster has summoned a creature, and they're fighting the entire group. Someone in chat redeemed a... Uh, a uh, make my monster grow is what it's called, and basically <laughs> it doubles the size of the target that the redeemer chooses, um, and they gain plus ten damage rating. And so that's you know, someone did that, and I was like, okay, well here we go. This thing grows twice its size, and then someone redeemed it again, and so now it's quadruple its size. And then someone redeemed the same thing again, but this time on one of the player characters. And so then we have this sudden Godzilla fight between these two hulking beings while everyone else is like scurrying around underneath them trying to kill everything else. Uh, and it was just so much chaos and fun uh, being able to do that. But to your point, sometimes, <laughs> you know, when we're doing a live show like that, you get so much random interaction uh, and and things affecting what you're doing. That honestly, you sit back like I did that night and just laugh w along with everybody. Like, oh, this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when now, um, you did you did drop a hint about a about a second edition. Now I realize these kind of things are in flux, but. Um, when do you suppose you, when do you suppose you'll have something a bit more substantial regarding that? Uh, we've actually been working on second edition for a while now. Um, second edition starter kit. I actually just got the proof of today in the uh, uh, in the mail. Mm -hmm. The digital edition will be available well before the physical edition, and we're hoping that the uh, to put that on sale hopefully in the next two or three weeks um, by the end of October uh, was our goal mm -hmm. um, as far as the physical starter kit I'm still working with uh, this is a prototype obviously um, but I'm still working with uh, printers and all that stuff uh, like manufacturing printers not like my printer at home um, obviously <laughs> yeah it's not doing the box right <laughs> um so uh that will take a little bit more time but the actual core rule book um uh, needs a little bit of adjustment and some minor editing our goal for that one uh for the core rule book was uh end of december mid to end december uh, so hopefully we should have that done in November and then send off for a small print run after that. Um, right now we're actually trying to decide if we put the kicks, uh, if we put the second edition into a Kickstarter, um, either the starter kit is a Kickstarter or the book is a Kickstarter um, and kind of go from there. But we haven't made that decision yet, but it is almost ready so very close we can i can literally reach over right now and touch the prototype so mm -hmm. that's me touching it. yeah <laughs> <laughs> which un unfortunately is one of is one of those cases of bre of breaking the rules of t of television yeah which is why which is why it's a good thing we're not on television otherwise i'd probably get my, i'd probably end up um Giving at, le giving at least half my salary to the FCC for the amount of swearing I do. 
<laughs> that's fair yeah and drinking uh, yep that's uh so uh, i i have to drink coffee when we do our podcasts mm -hmm. i find that uh the caffeine gives me a boost of energy and i just i i, I feel like i'm more focused <laughs> when i'm drinking coffee during this show <laughs> But I'll um I'll definitely be I'll definitely be keeping an eye out and I know you I know you mentioned the um the the set the um starter kit for second edition but but um I get the but I get the feeling eventually that will blossom into a full second edition pair of books or just one book I'm not sure if you're gonna do the whole player's guide arc master's guide um setup again. Yeah, we uh we've been penning this one as a single book. Um, one of the fun things that we've been doing through the entirety of sec second edition and our second season of our podcast um, is not only writing second edition, but we're also technically writing the first uh, ever expansion to the core rulebook, uh, full blown. And so if you go listen to our uh, arc two of Shattered Dungeons, we're actually playing through a lot of concepts and lore and content from our, our, uh, the expansion to our, our core rulebook. And so effectively from a product line standpoint, uh, we'll have the second edition's Shattered Dawn starter kit, uh, second edition Shattered, Con Shattered Dawn core rulebook, um, and then we'll have an expansion called the Azure, and that explores uh, basically another dimension. Uh, it's very weird, very different. Um, and then in addition to those, uh, we'll have several arcs. Uh, arcs are basically like adventure modules, uh, for those of you familiar with those. Um, they're stories that you can sit down and you don't have to write yourself. You can kind of lead some players through the adventure. Um, and most of it's uh, dialogue based. So it's uh, uh, some adventures in those arcs are, hey, explore these rooms in a dungeon. Um, but for the most part, um, it's all narrative and story driven. So it's presenting scenarios to your players, letting them deal with those scenarios, uh, and then kind of advancing the story with those decisions in mind. Mm -hmm. And I'll like I said I'll definitely be keep keeping an eye out for for that when the t when the time comes. Um, the mm -hmm. only reason I I couldn't focus on just the starter set is that um, as not as nice as it is to have that there's not there's not going to be a whole lot of meat for me to chew on with just that. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, definitely. Uh, and honestly, uh, if anyone is interested in checking out how Second Edition plays. Mm -hmm. Um, all of our arc two on Shattered Dungeons is us playing second edition Shattered Dawn. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a like a uh, there's a couple one shots. Um, everything after arc one point five is second edition Shattered Dungeons. One point five was a uh, basically a a month long uh, one pseudo one shot, a four shot, if you will. <laughs> Uh, four episodes of the same adventure uh, where we basically played near max level second edition characters. And so that that was our first big play test. And, and we were able to adjust some things that didn't quite work from that. Um, but like I said, all of arc two for Shattered Dungeons is second edition Shattered Dawn. So. Yeah, I got I gotcha. And. Uh, like I said, I'll be ke I'll be keeping a very close eye on how on how it's going to work. Um, mm -hmm. With that with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. Oh, I, I love it! I appreciate it so much. I I really do enjoy doing interviews about this stuff. It's mm -hmm. been such a a huge part of my life, and it's affected me in such a a major way. Just mm -hmm. the the tabletop community at large. Um, I have so many friends I've made through uh, not only doing Shattered Dawn, but just uh, doing podcasts and playing sessions with people. It, it really has been neat to see everyone uh, not only grow individually, but just grow together as a, an overall community. Mm -hmm. And 
Of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> oh. And of course, and of course, there, and of course, a sincere thank goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>